Uh, my name is Mark Music. Uh, I'm your county assessor, and I've been your county assessor for 16 months. So it's been a very interesting 16 months for us uh, coming on board, but we're excited. We've been excited about it. We've, we've made some changes, and one of the changes is part of this forum. Is what one of the changes we wanted to make. And someone said, well, how did you come about that? Well, basically, it's talking to a lot of people going to their homes, and they're asking about their values or other components of the office. And Chuck and I, who's my chief deputy, who would sit down and explain some of the situations. And I said, you know what? What a better way than just to do some education forms, to bring the staff out who have their department areas, and kind of put together a presentation to present to people. Something that's not a drawn out process, nothing real long, but hit on some key areas of what the assessor's office does. So I think there is a misconception out there of what the assessor's office does. I think everyone thinks it's mostly all personal property and real estate. There's a lot more that goes to it. So my staff have put together some information uh, to present to a PowerPoint, which I give Jeff credit. Uh, Jeff Welsh is our IT person for the county. We put all that information together so we could have this opportunity to present this PowerPoint. So kind of the forum tonight is going to be where staff will go through individually, identify themselves in the department, and go through their part on the slide, which you should be able to follow in your pamphlet. That's yours to take, yours to put notes on, and uh, feel free to ask any questions. You know, one of the things, too, about this county is I know there's been a lot of negativity over the last several years because we had the mass appraisal, which we're still going through. And the one thing that I always like to share with people is our county is moving forward. There's a lot of positive going now with the state. Are we quite where we're supposed to be? No. We're not in compliance as of yet. We're getting closer. Uh, we are passing areas that we haven't passed before, so which is a good sign. So it means we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And it is a difficult challenge because it's a hurdle. And everybody's seeing that based on values, how they've kind of gone up. But there's certain things by code that we have to do that may not have been done on a regular basis before. So we're kind of in that middle there to get into compliance. And actually, we're one of three counties that's still out of compliance. Another one's working towards it. So all those, kind of, all those three, including us, are moving forward, which is a good sign. Uh, so that's kind of a brief little intro there of where we were and where we're at. I just wanted to make sure that I got across. There is progress showing, and there is positive side. How much longer, uh, someone will say this massive price is going when we get to the 90%. Our goal has been the 2015 tax year which gets ready to come up in July 1 of this year, starts your 2015 tax year. Our goal is to get through that season, hopefully, to be in compliance, which then it's up to us to do what we're supposed to do each year and make sure that we remain above that 90% power. So we don't roll back and get caught into that. Uh, so with that information there, I want to go ahead and start with my staff and uh, getting them started. And as I'll introduce the first person here is uh, Amy Gundy. Amy is uh, our supervisor of our personal property. I'm going to give a little brief intro of herself. My name is Amy Gundy. I've been with the assessor's office for 16 years. I'm the personal property manager of the office. And I'm just going to go ahead and get started, okay? Um, Okay, West Virginia State Code says that you must file an assessment return July 1st and report all personal property. Um, we mail out your assessment returns. If for some reason you don't receive one, you have to contact the office and let us know. Personal property consists of basically anything that you would title or register through the DMV. But here I give you um, more of a complete list of what we expect to, you to, to report on your assessment return. Some of the questions we get in the office is how do we arrive at the value for your vehicles? Um, the VIN number tells us everything that we need to know to value your vehicles. It gives us the make, the body style, um, the year. Then we use the NADA guide to, to get that value. Um, take 60% of that value, that's called your assessed value. We multiply that by the levy rates. Levy rates vary from year to year, and that yields your tax dollars. 
As you see down there on the bottom, we gave you an example of a 2010 Toyota Matrix. With the NADA value at 12,625, you take 60% of that, gives you your assessed value at 7,575. Multiply that by the levy rate. I use the levy rate for this year if you're in the county. Gives you taxes at 100, or yeah, $147.35. And then the next slide here just shows you um, the NADA book that we use, and then we have an online program that gives us that value. Uh, state code also says that you are required to pay a head tax on all breeding age goats and breeding age sheep. It's a dollar a head. Uh, you can pay that to the assessor's office. This year, uh, that will actually be on your assessment return. This is the first year we're getting it on the assessment return to make it easier for the taxpayers to send in their payment for that. Does all that money stay in the county to reimburse the farmers when they get losses because of uh, IOD or golf kills? Or does it go to the state and then? My understanding is that it stays to the county. But I would have to do some research on that and get that get back to you on that. Because Mark, do you know? Do, now, does any of that? Now, that dollar ninety cents goes to the state. Now oh, that little cents. reimbursed back if there's any damage to a sheep or anything like that, then you get that money back from that. So. Okay. <clears throat> Did not know that. That's good information. Okay. Um, you're also required by state code to pay a license fee each year for your dogs. Um, you can either send that in with your assessment return, mail a check-in, or we're out in the county, we do satellites. There'll be a list of those satellites in with your assessment return this year, and you can come out to one of our satellite locations and purchase your dog tags and turn in your assessment there. Um, tags are $6 per tag. If you live inside the city limits of Morgantown, which would be 1st Ward through 7th Ward, Westover, Star City, or Granville, um, all other areas in the county, the tax is $3. Um, dogs known to be vicious or trained as attack or guard dogs require an additional $10 license. And guide dogs and therapy dogs are tax exempt. Okay, this year we did some changes to the assessment return. Um, the information that's requested is basically the same. It's laid out a little bit different. It will still be pre-printed with your information if we have your account on file from the previous year. And in the event that you would receive a blank assessment return, just fill it out and send it in or bring it out to one of our satellites and we'll help you out with that. And then we should have a picture here of what our old form looked like on the left and what our new form looks like on the right. Did you all have any questions for me? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and let Jackie Barron, she is our business personal property uh, deputy, and I'll let her take over. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Barron. I work in the business department of the Monongahela County Assessor's Office. All commercial business property is required to be filled out and submitted by September 1st of each tax year. Um, that is all. Um, tangible assets the business holds and um, this is the first page of the commercial business property return um, the main thing with the um, first page is the is your name of the business the address phone number email address FEIN and business registration ID account number Um, the second page is Schedule A. Machinery and equipment, furniture and fixtures, leasehold improvements, and computer equipment are all reported on this page. Um, you start with the current year, which would be this year, July 1st, 2014, and list each year uh, sequentially um, down through the years. And they will be depreciated um, by the state tax tables and depending on what type of business you are, and that is with machinery and equipment. But furniture and fixtures, leasehold improvements, and computer equipment are all depreciated on a straight trend and percent bid table throughout all businesses. The third page, schedules B, C, D, and E are all provided on. The first is where you would list um, any type of business inventory other than dealership inventory and rental car in inventory. Um, a big, a very important part of this page is the Schedule E where 
vehicles are listed. Vehicles, trailers, motorboats, aircraft, and mobile homes. You have to have a dealer's inventory worksheet to report your inventory at any type of vehicle dealership. Um, the instructions are on the back of this page and um, a dealer would have to submit an income statement from the previous year with this worksheet as well, as well as rental car inventory. That's okay. Rental car inventory um, is also explained on the back of your worksheet when you receive it with your return. Any business that has a um, 20 vehicles or more, or any large amount of vehicles is gonna receive a fleet sheet with their return. They will need to um, make sure they provide us with their purchase price and purchase date for all vehicles. That includes trailers, mobile homes, motorboats, aircraft. Also, any additional equipment that is added to the vehicles must be listed on this form as well. <coughs> the last page of the commercial business property return are schedules F, G, and H, and that's incomplete construction, salvage value, machinery and equipment, and pollution control facilities. This page also needs to be signed and dated by the preparer and the owner of the business. Uh, calculating the assessed values for the business, um, like I said, depends on what type of business you conduct for your machinery and equipment. When, how we come to that value is we take the acquisition cost of your personal property, less depreciation, multiply it by 60%. That way we come to the assessed value. When we take that, multiply it by the levy rate, and, and that's how we to your tax amount. And the commercial business wrap up, I like to call common errors that, that must be avoided. Um, do not report your vehicles that are a portion plated by the state um, to your local assessor's office. Um, tax years in Schedule A need to be listed sequentially starting with the current year. Do not skip years. Do not write in the assessor's use column, please. This is used for office purposes. Always list the property you own July 1st, unless you are a rental car inventory, hold rental car inventory, or you are a vehicle dealership. Reference the worksheets that are provided. And do not send in a blank return with a note stating all of the property is the same as the previous tax year. The return must be filled out in completion. And that's all I have this evening. Um, Ms. Shirley Zachary will be presenting. My name is Shirley Zachary, and I've worked with the assessor's office for 36 years, and I'm the math room supervisor. The first subject I'd like to talk about is the tax increment financing, also known as TIF. TIF was established during the 2002 legislative session in House Bill 4624 to facilitate new economic development and growth in a certain geographic area. TIF is generally used to prepare land for future development, install sidewalks, sewer water, and electric lines to industrial sites, or building a road that improves access to an area. An example of this is the access road over off of 705 that goes back to the Mon General Hospital. That road is being paid for with TIF dollars. TIF value is determined by subtracting the base assessed value from the current assessed value to determine the incremental value or the difference. If your house is assessed at $50,000 for the base year and the following year it increases to $51,000, the tax dollars on that $1,000 is all that would be paid in the TIF fund. The remainder of the taxes would be distributed the way they always had been in the past. Property owners that live in a designated TIF area do not pay higher taxes. Only the distribution of taxes paid are affected. Monongahela County currently has seven TIF projects. They are the Riverfront Development Project, Falling Run Redevelopment, Star City Project TIF, 
Morgantown Industrial Park, Sunnyside Up, Mon General Hospital, and the latest one is the University Town Center TIF, where they're building a new ball field. They're also building an exit off of I-79 to get in and out of the ball field, and that uh, exit is being paid for with TIF dollars. Okay, the next topic is natural resources. Manage timberland. Property owners with 10 or more acres of wooded land can get a discount on their tax bills. Land designated as a subdivision does not qualify. The initial contract for managed timberland property should be submitted to the West Virginia Division of Forestry in Charleston, West Virginia before July the 1st. The contract must state that the real estate is being used in a planned program with timber management and erosion control practices intended to enhance the growth of timber. The annual application for certification as managed timberland must be submitted to the Division of Forestry by September 1st annually. Okay, farm use valuation. <clears throat> the term farm use refers to a tract or continuous tract of land currently being used as part of a farming operation, primarily for farming purposes, rather by the owner thereof or by a tenant. Farmland is divided into three categories, tillable for raising crops, pasture for grazing livestock, and woodland for growing timber. You must farm at least five acres of land with an annual gross income of $1,000 or more to qualify. Less than five acres of land will also qualify as long as your annual gross income is $500. Eligibility for farm status qualifies you for a reduction in the value on your real estate. There are currently 29,090 acres of land in Montegay County being farmed and 1,153 property owners receiving farm status. Farm use forms must be filed with the assessor not later than September 3rd annually. There is also a $1 head tax for each sheep and goat of breeding age kept on the farms. The fee for farm use stickers for vehicles is $2 <coughs> and the farm form must be submitted and approved by the assessor prior to the issuance of the sticker. Okay, coal, oil, and gas. <coughs> House Bill 4127 requires that all coal, oil, and gas be appraised by the state tax department at current market value. With a lot of our coal being depleted, coal companies are looking more towards processing coal bed methane, which is a dry gas and can be used for heat and power or electricity. West Virginia and neighboring states are sitting on top of two of the largest formations called Marcellus and Utica, which run right under Montgay County. Unlike conventional gas involving pumping it from rock formations, Marcellus shell is dense and doesn't allow the free flow of gas, so horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing were combined to tap into shell gas using pressurized water to make it flow. There are approximately <coughs> 300 wells in Montegay County, six of which are producing Marcellus gas. Did anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, Susan is up. Uh, We'll be talking about the homestead exemptions next. Hi, my name is Patricia Luger, and I've been with the County Assessor's Office for about 14 years. Um, the homestead exemption, take this off this, is a program provided by the state for a $20,000 exemption against the total assessed value of a single family dwelling. In order to qualify for this exemption, you have to be either 65 years or older or permanently totally disabled. You have to be 65 before the July 1st assessment date in order to qualify for this exemption. Um, you only need one exemption per household, and we ask the people apply between July 1st and December 1st in order to qualify for the next tax year. Um, you need to only apply once. <coughs> you must live in your home in order to qualify, whether it's a mobile home, a double wide, or the house that you live in. Even if you live in a trailer park and you own the trailer, you would still qualify for that exemption also. Um, this exemption applies to the first $20,000 of your assessed value. So say if your home is assessed at $100,000, you would only pay taxes on $80,000. So it usually saves you between two and $250 a year on your taxes. Um, 
In order to also qualify for this exemption, you have to live in the property for at least six months before you can apply for this exemption. You also have to live in the state of West Virginia for at least two years also. But if you've lived in the state for 10 years or moved away for two and came back, you could still qualify for this exemption. Um, I think this year, uh, from our reports, I said that we have about 64, almost 6,500 people on the homestead exemption, and that's about 60,000 people in real estate and about 460-some in the personal property, say in the trailer parks and so. so. Um, each month or each day, I pull the cards for people that have passed away and no longer live in homes, or say if they've sold their homes and have moved on, and I think this year we've already pulled about 200 cards. So it's a pretty fast moving process when we do these homesteads. Well, Any other questions on this? Yeah, what was the number on exemption? Uh, I think from the reports we just got for this tax year coming up, it's about 64, I think I had 460 personal property records and about 6,000 on the real estate, people that are actually now qualifying for that exemption. And that's between you know disabilities and people 65 years or older. So, yes, have any questions? What would be your own personal property? Like people that would own a mobile home, like in a trailer park. That's more of a called a personal property because they actually don't own the land; they just own the trailer. See, and so they can get an exemption from that too. Yeah. Anybody else any questions? Okay, next up is Chris Lowe, and she's part of our new commercial and residential prices.
The assessor is required to value property annually. However, at least once every three years, he has to go look at your property, actually be on site. Um, the assessor has to develop a three-year plan and submit it to the state tax department, showing the timeline and how he's going to accomplish this. And Montague County has 19 districts. Uh, this year we're scheduled to review wards one and two of the city of Morgantown and also all of Morgan district. We'll look at any new construction and there, there are a few parcels out in the Union District that, that we still need to do this year. So you will probably see some of us running around. We will have our ID on and we've ordered some yellow vests that will help identify who we are. Uh, when we come by your house, uh, we will we'll review all the <coughs> external measurements. Um, there, there's some interior information that, that we would also like to have. Uh, if you're not available to talk to us, we'll leave a door hanger. That's the door hanger. On the left hand side, there's uh, the data regarding the inside of your house or information we can't gather from the outside. Uh, review that information. If it's incorrect, there's a section on the right hand side, property owner corrections. And you just make those corrections and send it back to us. You can also give us a call, the phone number is at the bottom. Uh, a few components of data collection. Uh, one of the big components, well, probably the biggest component around here is the land, which is priced separately from the house. Um, it's measured in acreage, square feet, or front feet. And location, 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 the value of your land is driven by the market. Um, there are a few examples of, of grade. You have to determine what grade your house is. And the grade's basically the complexity of the design, the quality of the construction. Uh, you can see there's an A grade, there's an example of a C grade, and an E grade. And going back to the land, if you took that C grade house and you had it in the city of Morgantown, that parcel is going to be valued much higher than if that home were located in a, like a depressed area on a dirt road. So the location, again, makes a huge difference. Um, there's also the CDU factor. That stands for condition, desirability, and utility. That goes anywhere from excellent to unsound. And that's one thing that can frequently change when we're out viewing your house. Um, we look at the condition. If we see that it was in fair condition before and you replaced the windows and the siding, uh, we might up it a little because it's in better condition now. And vice versa, if we see it's fallen into disrepair, we'll lower it. And then there's the square footage. Uh, we base the square footage on external measurements. <coughs> and that's the, the property record card. I'll come over here so I can point a few things out to you. We went over the, the grade. There's the grade factor, D, in this case, this example. That's less than average. You can see where it's factored down to 78%. Come down here to the CDU. Uh, this home was, uh, was determined it was fair, which is less than average, so it was factored down again. Now, I'm not going to go through this entire document, but there is a one of these property record cards for every parcel in this county. Um, over here, you have the the outbuildings and yard improvements. That would include the garages, utility buildings. Um, here's the the land information. Um, this is the, the entrance information. The last person who was on your property had these initials. He was there on that date. Um, your sales information, the property sold in December of 2012 for $20,000. This code here indicates that it was not a valid sale, so it, it was not on the open market and would not be included in any of the studies that we conduct every year. Um, here you can see there are the dimensions, which gives you the, the square footage, wood decks, porch. 
pretty much it for the property record card, which you can get at our office for your property if you want. And how to estimate your real estate tax. You take the market value of your home and land, you multiply that by 60% to give you your assessed value. And the assessed value is what is the taxable value that uh, we applied the levy to. So we're going to use an example of a, a uh, parcel that's worth $100,000. Uh, we take that and multiply that by 60%, which gives you the assessed value of $60,000. You take that, multiply that by the current levy rate, and that will give you your tax. If you have the homestead exemption, you go one step further. You take that market value of 100,000 and you multiply it by 60% to get your assessed value. Then you deduct your $20,000 homestead exemption. Then your taxable amount would end up being $40,000. And? The levy rate that it will apply to you will depend on what class you are in. If you are in class two, that is property owned and used and occupied by the owner exclusively for residential purposes, or an active farm used or occupied by the owner or a bona fide tenant. Then you have your class three, which is small <coughs> real and personal property, exclusive of class two, that is not located or that is situated outside of a municipality. <coughs> and then class four is, is real and personal property exclusive of class two that's situated inside a municipality. So that's all, all I have on the residential. Um, I'll we'll turn it over to, to Chris Michael. Uh, one, one question, if you, okay. turn, if you turn 65 this year, then you have to come in mm -hmm. and file mm -hmm. after July 1st. The homestead expert here. When did you turn 65? Uh, last August. Well, you're eligible now, so you can come in any time. Yeah, you come in, or we send you out a card, and you mail it back, mail back the information, and we'll put you on to the next tax year. Yeah. Hi, my name is Chris Michael, and I'm the new commercial appraiser at Long County. I've been in this business about 20 years now. In my 20, uh, from Tucker County, I was a county appraiser there. I've been a county commissioner. I worked for the state tax department as a senior appraiser. And now I've worked for, working for Mon County as a commercial appraiser. Uh, one thing I noticed right away is how busy this place is. It's pretty unbelievable. But believe it or not, due to the team and the people that we put together, we have several experienced people on staff. We're pretty well covered with the new construction, both on residential and commercial at this point. It's an ongoing process, and they build them. It seems like it rains, uh, like mushrooms, they just keep popping up, but we're chasing them and we're still getting them. But uh, I'm glad to be here, and I look forward to meeting the people with family. I've already met several, and uh, I've, I've enjoyed it so far. What is commercial property? The term commercial property refers to buildings or land intended to generate a profit either from capital gain or rental income. So that's pretty base. Um, I'm going to give you a short go through on how we <coughs> put together commercial buildings. It's a little different from the residential side because so many types, so many uses, and so many different building materials are used on commercial building. But in general, uh, of course, we need a year built. The type of structure could be a fast food franchise, a bank, a retail store, an office building, could be storage buildings, could be anything. Um, next, we have to grade the type of structure. Our grades run A, B, C, D, E also. But in general, an A is a well-built, good materials, good design, such as a bank or a nice office building, something like that. Uh, C grade could be like a dollar store or a family dollar or a supermarket, somewhere in that. And E grade poorly constructed, I don't know that I've actually seen any here, but maybe some old dilapidated structures on some vacant type properties. We may downgrade them to an E grade, reduce them to about 5%, just to have something on the record to 
incentive to clean them up. So that's for I'll fix it. Uh, the interior or exterior data for stories. We break the properties into sections. One building could have all three of those in it. You could have a huge retail space, some offices back in the corner, and then maybe as big a storage space. If you can picture like picture like a Walmart, those three sections actually value out of different dollar amounts. The construction type uh, could be a wood frame, wood joist, light steel, could be heavy duty fireproof steel, or fire resistant steel. We have several different things there also. Wall heights, that's something that's a little different than the residential side. I've seen them from eight feet to probably 90. So that makes a huge difference in what the actual cost of the building is. But we uh, need to have the individual heights for the different stories and the different sections. Interior finish is based on the type of structure. A uh, retail store is going to be different from a bank. A grocery store is going to be different from a storage building. Uh, the percentage completed, uh, usually if you had a warehouse, just a metal building, frame, get it up, everything's ready, you're ready to store goods in, it's 100% completed interior. It has a different interior than, say, the bank or the drug store or something of that. Exterior finish, again, there's probably 15 codes we have for those. Uh, it could be brick, stone, wood, block, glass, metal. There's just a big list there. Um, lighting, water, heating, cooling, those are all things that we factor in. Some have them, some don't. Physical and functional condition. Uh, that runs from poor, bare, normal, good or renovate. If you get a very old building and you totally rebuild it, that renovation key will be kicked in and that can change the depreciation factors. We also go to the attached improvements. Uh, you have an elevator inside, maybe a loading dock, overhead <coughs> doors, drive up windows. Again, there's actually hundreds on those lists to choose from for different type businesses we go to. And uh, other building yard improvements, same thing, there's just numerous amounts of different things out there, but canopy, shed, fencing, pole lights, paving, all those are taken into consideration when we're putting this property together. The land is, of course, size always matters. The use, uh, on a commercial site, you usually have a primary site where maybe the actual structure is located. Secondary could be a parking lot or a storage beside the inside the business. Residuals, basically the ground that's left over maybe runs off into the creek or down to the highway to really can't do anything with. Or until something's actually done with it, it could be put in as an unclassified and undeveloped land waiting on the future intention by the owner. And again, as Chris said, location, location, location is huge. Um, we have many different location factors, central business district, major strip district, industrial park or your small mom and pop stores in a neighborhood or spot uh, like Walgreens and CVS out by the hospital. I don't think it gets any better than that. That's about as top dollar district or location as you can find. And yearly we do cost studies of the new buildings. Our office has a very good working relationship <coughs> with the developers, the contractors, the owners. We get a lot of information, a lot of current data from them, and we're happy that they're so cooperative and it makes our job a lot easier. We look at the vacant land sales and we look at the valid commercial sales. All these things go together that we try to keep our cost tables up. <coughs> we actually have cost tables for probably 25 or 30 of the franchise type buildings like McDonald's or a Hardee's or a Red Lobster that the companies have provided the state and whatnot. So we do have a vast array of data that we can go to. Our older buildings, they're valued at replacement cost new, less depreciation. We look at the current use. If you have an old abandoned retail store, uh, instead of a retail store anymore, maybe the owner's using it for storage. We can come and look at that, bring the use back to a storage building that's worth less money than what it would be as a retail store 
with what the physical functional condition, we can make an adjustment there. But we're willing to look at anybody thinks we need to, and we'll work with them. With regard to land value, uh, question: it, We don't have farmland protection as such in this county, but it is possible to, through the state, go ahead and place your farm uh, under this if it meets the course requirement. Uh, you've now made this only be sold as one full unit. Of course, let's just say the tract is 20 acres plus your house. Mm -hmm. Is there a consideration given for this? Because now you've taken it uh, to, let's say, less marketable. It could be potentially be a area to be developed, but now you've made it so that it couldn't be developed. How do you handle that? That's true. It could be at a different value, and we'd have to see the stipulations and whatnot. I think in that regard, if you had the house, I've seen it to where maybe the last relative of your son, say, dies. house gets torn down. I've seen different stipulations on different things. Well, it's not a stipulation. There's a state code that allows you to do farmland protection independent of whether or not your county has it. The, the commission doesn't have anything to do with it? You can tear down any house, but you can only build one house on the footprint of the house and, or ever, how many houses are there. I know one gentleman in Tucker but, that put some in. He was allowed to build both of his children a house. But yeah. once they were but gone... He's doing a personal, he's doing a personal will. Uh, this, is, this is actually the... Okay. The, the, the real farmland protection that has to meet the code of either architectural, excuse me, archaeological or historical or uh, drive-by value. I think that would be a special case, and I'd be glad to look at the agreement, see what it stip okay. stipulates, and we would work on it. Yeah. Yes, sir. And it's probably kind of the relationship that we have with some of the buildings going on. You say the land value. So if the land is open, owned by an entity that is non-taxable, a WVU, a church, school system, the developer comes in and puts a building on it in a public-private relationship. The building now should have a separate value than what the land has. Does the land become more valuable because the building is on it or does the land sustain its value and the building gets taxed because the building is a commercial for-profit enterprise? Part of that I would have to put to our assessor, Mark Music, that been working on some of those very situations here in the town. And it has to do with the university and different things. But I uh, use some locations to drive value, whether it's taxed or not. And definitely uh, that could change but whether they pay taxes or not. Now on the building, I've had leaseholds. And leaseholds, the buildings were taxable. And maybe not the parcel was on. So it depends on the lawyers and the litigation and how they... So, 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 so what's happening now is still not clear? Through, the, through the, this process in the assessor's office until we get clarification from the judicial system? That's pretty much it. I think they've asked for a ruling from the state of Charleston, and I believe even the university may have, that they're trying to get something on paper to tell us where we stand. Right? And, and for obvious reasons, you can see where the developers who own the land and then build the building are having an issue. Yes. Yes, ma'am. On well, your previous, uh, uh, yeah. What qualifies as an old building? Oh, um, if it's built before such and such, or older building condition. No, mainly what I was going through and how we put one together was the newer buildings. An older building can be anything that's already done. We had it. Oh, okay. I was basically showing you how we put together a newer building, a oh. brand new building, and the different components of things to come up with that. But anything that's been around for any period of time, if it's if use change, condition change, we do go door to door every three years. And this year we're going in Ward 1, 2, 7, and more. And also, if somebody has a question about something, well, I'm more than happy to come look at it. 
everybody gives us a call and makes us aware, which a lot of people do. Did you take an account of how old the building is when you're doing the value of it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. It's uh, depreciated and, and like I say, the use dictates it. Is it still being used? If it's not being used, the condition and the functionality of it all comes into help value of this. Okay. Oh, yes, sir. My question is, is gas related. Actually, it's two. One is uh, the mineral underground, which most of us don't know. How is that tax? That would be one. But the other one is, if they want to come on my property and put a gas well down, that also is a pretty hot issue. But my question to you is, if they come onto my property and put a gas well in, they create a massive road that's better than half the road we travel on in this uh, county. And also, once that site is developed, that road is still there. So theoretically, do I have to pay more for that gas well sitting on my property, even though I'm not uh, profiting from it? And who pays the increased value because of the road that they created to get to their product? Um, the roads that they would have are probably a semi-improved type road. I don't know if anybody paid them or anything. I'm not going to come in and increase the value of the property because then they put a well. As a matter of fact, if they took some of your choice grounds, we would look at that and maybe reclassify them and even lower some of it if they took some good ground out of use to make it to where it isn't usable for that anymore. So if there was a protected well to go on your property, could we come to you and present what they're saying they're going to do to make sure, because if you don't get it in a contract with them, you're not going to get paid increase. And, and I'm not so sure that down the road, 20 years, when you or Mark or whoever's not in there, doesn't come on and say, that road, because I'm telling you, they build roads that's uh, an envy. I've seen some. And uh, could that be increased later on, saying that that could be of a value to you? The only thing we really use roads for are um, access to your home <coughs> or location of businesses. But if you're out on a farm, somebody's got to, I'm not going in there and look for roads. I mean, everybody's got them on their farms, we don't tax them. Uh, like I said, the well site, if you have some nice pasture land there and they whack five acres, I could probably turn that into a residual or a wasteland type it probably would actually get down in value because it wouldn't have the same current views. And if you had anything else about mineral values... Yeah, the mineral who uh, sure How is that taxed? Sure uh, your oil and gas is taxed at $25 per acre and then we, 60% uh, of that is what we tax you on. That's for non-producing oil and gas. Now if it's a producing uh, well, you've got a working interest and a royalty interest. We tax seven-eighths of the MCFs taken out of that well to the producer and the one-eighth to all the royalty owners involved in the well. And, it, and it's up to the producer to turn an annual report in every year to tell the state tax department and us who they're paying the royalty to, and we tax them in accordance with what's on that report. So if I've got a lease out there, say 10 acres, and I'm getting a royalty check off of it. I'm also I'm going to have to pay the IRS naturally, yes, and now I also have to pay personal property on my share of the royalty. No, what what you would be uh, taxed on is the your worth in that well, and it's based on how many MCFs is pulled out of that well. And what it does, the formula, it accounts it back to current market value, like. The Department of Energy will say, or the Geological Survey will say, well, that well will be producing for 35 more years. It calculates it every year, and then there's a trending factor and trends it back to current market value as to what your worth would be based on if you own uh, one eighth of 10 acres or one thirty second of five acres, whatever your worth is in that well. <coughs> That is not your income. Your income, you've got to turn in on your income tax. We do not tax you on that, but we go by the MCFs that's pulled out of that well yearly. Okay, if, and this is a big issue, it's out there, <clears throat> is if there's a 100 acres of gas rights there and you can buy up 90 acres of them, which is what you're selling or what you're assessing it at is far less than its value out there. 
but say 10 acres, a person decides, I'm not selling it. So these other 90 acres becomes a lot more profitable and better uh, tax base for the county and also for the state. Do you then increase that 10 acres because that person decides they don't want to do anything with it, but the value is clearly there? Um, is that taxed in another way? No. Uh, if it's just oil and gas in reserve, it's a flat $25 per acre. And then 60% of that is what we tax you on. It doesn't matter if it's part of a well or not. Where that formula changes is when that well starts producing and there's MCFs being pulled out of it. That's a different formula. And it, it no longer is $25 per acre because they have to arrive at how, uh, uh, if you wanted to sell your interest in that well, it wouldn't be $25 per acre. It's much more valuable now because you're getting an income from it. So they, what they would do is uh, they would uh, discount it back to current market value, but they would have to take into consideration how many years that well is going to be producing to arrive at what your, your value is if you wanted to sell your interest in that well. When was the last time that the gas and the oil has been looked at what it's worth per acre if it just lays on the ground? I'll tell you, it, it used to be 20 acres. It changed two years ago. They raised Montegay County to $25 per acre. There are other counties where it's $15, but Montegay County increased from $20 to $25 uh, two years ago. Thank you. This is a final county ratio report, and this is actually the report card for the county and the values of the properties that were sold for uh, 2014. Um, if you notice on the bottom here, the aggregate ratios, residential approved, residential vacant, commercial wall, total, should be somewhere between 90 and 110. Uh, the median ratio should be somewhere between 90 and 110. CAD is 15 or less for residential approved, 20 or less for residential vacant, 20 or less for all commercials. We were close. Uh, I think two, two or three years ago, the county was in the 70s. The last year, it came up to the low 80s. This year, if you notice, we have to pass one of those, the median or aggregate. We got up to 87 on residential improved, 89 on residential vacant, and 89 on commercial. CODs, 11, 13, and 9, 12 overall. That means that actually the properties are in a pretty level values amongst the neighborhoods. There's not a big discrepancy in the prices of homes. There's not a big discrepancy in how we're valuing them. Here's some numbers I kind of pulled out for the, thought you might be interested in. The total value among county for real and personal property for the 2014 tax year was over $5.3 billion. Now to me, that's a lot of money, federal government, probably not, but I think that's a pretty good sum. Um, our sales ratio report had 856 valid sales. And Chris went over what a valid sale was, and one thing I will mention, um, these are single parcel sales. IS is not sophisticated enough that we could link a property with three different parcels together to find one sales value. So those are all just single parcel sales, there were 856 of them. The total consideration paid was $186,750,000. Our total appraised value was $160,500,000. That gives us a median ratio of 87.25%. And uh, it shows we're close. We're getting better. Um, we're trying to move forward. We're trying to do it in a slow but deliberate way. We're trying to do it with the taxpayer in mind. And all our neighborhoods aren't bad. We have some that are fine right where they are. We have some others that we got to get caught up on, and that's what we're working towards this year. And just for your other information, and Mark mentioned this when he started, only three counties did not pass this test for 2014 tax year, and those were Lincoln, Wyoming, and Montegay. And does anybody have any questions?
I'll give you a check pan. He's the deputy assistant. Thank you, Mr. Chris. I guess our audience got a little bit smaller. <laughs> I'll be more personal. Um, my name is Chuck, I'm the Chief Deputy in the office, so I thought, uh, what, what we've done uh, as we've given this presentation, kind of try to wrap things up for folks. Uh, these folks have done a fantastic job communicating kind of on a specific level what we're doing and how it works. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is impart kind of the vision uh, of the office, what we've kind of encountered, where we're going, that kind of thing. Uh, we came on board, not this January, but the January before that, and one of our uh, immediate objectives was to look at the office administratively, uh, try to tighten things up so that we can have a process that was more secure, more positive, more reliable for the taxpayers and what we were doing. So we spent a lot of time in the first year understanding what we were doing, showing up processes, trying to promote a more positive community-based image, uh, surveying taxpayers to see what they wanted and needed out of the office and the ex expectations. And that's kind of what led to these community forums. Uh, as Mark said, that, that was kind of what some of the feedback that we got, Mark, was bring the office back out uh, to the people, uh, make it friendly, make the information reliable, tell us what's going on, is it fair, is it equitable? So that's been a lot of our energy uh, in the first year, is, and, uh, besides learning a very complicated process. I mean, assessing and valuing property uh, is, is, very, um, is very involved, so it's been a, a learning year as well. Um, so we worked on that. One of the big things that uh, Mark's put a tremendous amount of energy into uh, this year. It was an incredibly positive thing, and that was bringing the appraising part of what we do back uh, in-house, and that's what represents uh, our Chris's here. We have an entire unit uh, that uh, compri is comprised of the Chris's and the folks that they need who are actually coming out to value your property and take a look uh, at th how things are going in the county. So that's been a tremendous plus, uh, bringing that process in-house, uh, being able to work with these folks, uh, to be real conscientious of what the taxpayer need is for the county, going out and putting your, you know, your finger on the pulse uh, of what people are thinking uh, and needing and wanting. And so that, that's one of our big moves. Um, going into the future, we, we've really uh, been also looking at, let me back up. <laughs> one of the things that we did this year was establish, um, a, a, if you will, a strategic plan to look at uh, coming up with an organized way of trying to address the things that we uh, people either reported to us or things that we felt were valuable for the office. Uh, and a part of that strategic plan was getting on paper or in our head on many levels uh, what those goals and objectives were and, and working really hard towards them. Uh, one of the things that we are very optimistic and hopeful for uh, going into the future based on our travels to other uh, assessor's offices is looking at a way to get online filing. A lot of folks want the opportunity, particularly uh, you know, the young, trendier folks, want to be able to go to a site, fill out information, have it submitted. Uh, and so we've looked at other assessors' offices and, and, and the processes that they use to make that happen. And we're kind of we're on the cusp of being able to maybe get some of that stuff in place for us here in Mon County as well. So that's one of our big goals for this year is to take that assessment point, which can be a big cumbersome, people don't want to come downtown, all those kinds of things, looking at a way to get that form up so that people can actually file online. Um, so that, that's one of our objectives. One of the other large objectives that uh, you can probably look forward to as taxpayers is that we're looking at a GIS system, that's a geographic information system, and what that means for the average taxpayer is that Chris pointed out earlier what was called a, a property record card. That's the, all the electronic data that we have for your property in our system. With a GIS system, we would be essentially imposing a map, a digital map over top of that data, which gives us the ability to do a much more accurate property evaluation. When you access the data on your record, you'll see a much clearer picture. It'll be much more accurate. So we've uh, been very successful this year uh, in getting the county commission to endorse those efforts, along with a lot of other agencies uh, that we've worked with to, who also value and realize uh, that that is the way to go. The, the thing about GIS is that uh, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of like having a 1985 computer, that's kind of what we currently have, and then getting a 2014. At some point, you have to upgrade to be able to stay consistent with how things are happening, so that will be an enormously large move for our county, is to move from uh, just paper-based to an electronic way 
of looking at these parcels. Our, our, our appraiser team will be able to go out and see the subtle nuances of things like streams and hills and woodland and how uh, your property actually looks. Uh, so it's going to be a very, very useful tool. So we're very hopeful that that will be rolling out within probably the next 14 months or so. We'll be looking at at least uh, having a tremendous amount of success in that area. Uh, one of the other things that's based again on feedback from not only business uh, operators and owners in the community, real estate agents, taxpayers, folks want uh, uh, an assessor's website that's a lot friendlier. And we're aware that our current website can look a little you know, antiquated when it comes to all the bells and whistles that people have come to expect uh, from their electronic uh, uh, communications. So we've spent some time we're working with Jeff, who's our IT guy, who has been tremendously helpful uh, in helping us address some of these um, uh, issues that we want to look at in terms of a technology advancement. But um, our making some adjustments to our website to make it more taxpayer friendly, to make it more uh, user friendly, uh, to have the information be more organized. And again, we've looked at a lot of, a lot of other counties and we see what folks are doing. And, and the, the beauty of looking at other counties is that you get the, the, the full benefit of all that they're doing right and well, but hopefully not as many of the states. So we're very fortunate that the other assessors around the county have, have welcomed us uh, with open arms and we're taking full advantage of the information that they're willing to share with us. Uh, one of the last things that will always be a goal for the office is compliance uh, with the state codes with, with regards to property value. And as Chris mentioned, uh, he showed you our report card and we are dangerously close to being there, uh, if I may say. We're, and as Mark said earlier, we're hoping that 2015 will be that year. Uh, and once we get there, uh, staying there is a lot easier. So one of our goals has to be uh, to get us to that point and then we can hopefully stay there with as little um, disruption to the taxpayers of the county uh, as possible. So those are our big goals for the year. I'm sure I missed a few, but um, anybody have any questions? And as you'll see in your, in your pamphlet too, we have a contact thing. And the one thing that you have here is you've got a panel. You can pick up the phone, give them a call if you have a question send them an email, you'll get a great response. If you need to come in, they're there. If it's property you need to be seen, Chris would be more than happy to come out. Uh, we like to you know, follow too because it's still a learning process for us, but that's been the one great thing with this group is they're there for you. So they'll take that time and do that. And, uh, and I, you know, I give this group a lot of credit because this is basically outside of Chuck doing our previous stuff. This group, this is their second event within a week's time, and this is their second event. Meaning, this is their second event of doing a presentation like this, so. You would probably help out if you put it in the paper a couple times, I think. Yeah, yeah and, and, and as we're learning through this process on that and, and how we're getting it out there, and, we, and those are great, yeah, those are things coming down, and we're planning on doing a couple more throughout this year uh, that we want to do in different areas. And that'll be another way what we'll do is for the promoting. I think it'd be nice for uh, the new people coming in to go back once a year. Yeah. Yeah. That's my opinion. Well, we're, the, it's not going to end here with us. We're still going to do this even again next year also. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. We're, it's just not here, then that's it. Yeah. There's still much more we want to do. And, um, and that's why hopefully with this, when we get this kind of where we want it to be, it'll go up on our website. People will be able to pull that hopefully, you know, through with the video here. We'll be able to access that. But we're not stopping with this part. We want to continue to go because it's an education. It educates us. You know, it's not as much here, but we learn a great deal from one another. Uh, it gives us this time. But, you know, my hat's off to this group. It's, it's a great job. It takes a lot of time to put this information together and come out and present. So I'm thrilled with them. But there's my other side. Other people I got to give credit to because I got a whole office that runs on a daily basis. And, you know, I'll go right down through my list here real quick because I got to give them props too for what they do. And that's on uh, the personal property side. We still have Sue Ann Solomon, Sandra Hurd, and Vicki McCord who are there on a daily basis running that area on the side of Amy's. Uh, with Jackie, her supervisor is Brian Hose. So we have those two on that business side. We have three ladies that do our transfer and deeds. Uh, Nancy Holbert, Shirley Shea, and Rhonda Coulter. 
So those are people sometimes they don't see because they're in their own little office transferring all the deeds and getting them entered. Over with Shirley's side, it's Shirley and uh, Susan on theirs, but you still have Jim DeVincent, John Larita, and Michael Music who pick up that side on the real estate. John Ferguson heads up our mapping side. So John's there, so that's mapping's another critical part of what the office does, of course. And he's got John Harblin and uh, Brian Price and Kelly Green with his group there on the mapping side. Then we have our girls upstairs who do all of our data entry with uh, Joanne Marks, uh, Sherry Moran, Kim Zeigler, and uh, Linda Morse. So you have that component there within the office, and also we have the appraisal group that we put together. But we have Chris and Chris who are two appraisers, but they have to have staff underneath them in order to get the job done. We have our field deputies, uh, Dave Denardi, Brett Lamine, Michelle Wetzel. Uh, we, Alex Denard will start tomorrow. Uh, there's a new one coming on. We also have Steve Sigworth, who's one of our commercial uh, appraisers. We have Deborah Harrigan, who's our sales validation data entry person. John Alexander, data entry, and also uh, Deborah Tenyak is our other data entry person. Those are the people that make it up, and those are the people we're working with daily, and those are the ones that are there for you, and they're the ones that will help get us forward on this, because it's not, as I say, it's not about me, it's about these people and those people in the office who kind of get this thing going, we kind of just steer it for them. But my hat's off to this group, you know, it's exciting. Yes, would you want to see a few more here and there? Absolutely, but I think as this, as we grow, everything else will grow with it. So we learn and we appreciate those that come and the questions. I mean, I think we have some great questions tonight and covered some stuff. And if anything needs, if you leave here and you have a question, so you gotta do is pick up the phone, we'll be there for you. So if there's no further questions, I would like to go ahead and just close this out this evening and thank you all for attending.